Today's Tech Hour. It's Thursday the 5th and 6th of October and the topic is Safe Tech Macros and the underlying idea is that sometime soon I hope we'll be able to easily produce HTML5 and tag PDF from our tech source documents but every time we put a user tech macro that can potentially add a difficulty to that process so how can we do use tech macros in a way that is safe for future use and another side of it is making things easier for beginners and we all make mistakes and generally having tech documents that other software can read besides LaTeX and making it easier for human beings to find their way around. So I'm going to start by giving a very brief introduction to tech macros. And to do that, I'm going to do some screen sharing. And I'm going to do it unusually at the command line. So let's see what we can do. Uh, sorry. Uh, share screen. That will be it. Okay, is that uh, big enough, the font? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to use plain tech. And I'm going to do things at the command line. Uh, macros are not about typesetting. Macros are about the stuff that goes into typesetting. So if I do message hello, do you see it says hello at the console? And that's a way of seeing what's going on. So we can now use a macro. So let me give an example of a macro that's already defined by plain tech and it expands the argument into a line with horizontal stretch and shrink, horizontal stretch and shrink either side of the argument. And let me also show what line is. And line is simply H box to H size. And while we're at it, let me show what H box is. And that's text way of saying there ain't no thing underneath an H box. An H box is an H box. So it's a primitive command. And if we do show H size, H size is a primitive command. Now, if I do message the H size, we'll see that it's that strange number of points and quite why it gets to be that number, I don't know, but it's the width of the page. So let me, I'll do another message. And I think this works. The center line. Uh, let's try again. Message, wrong command, <laughs> meaning. Now these are commands that ordinary users shouldn't be using. But this is just a way of getting hold of what's going on. So let me give you an example of how macros work. So I'm going to define a macro saying me def. Well, first of all, I'll show me and it's undefined. Now I'm going to def me Jonathan. 
And now if I show me, we get Jonathan. Uh, the period at the end of my name is not added to the macro, it's just simply saying that's the end of the macro definition. And we can see that more clearly if I message meaning me. So I'm now going to message center line me. And what's happened is that the center line has expanded and the me has expanded. And when this appears on the page, we'll get my name on a line by itself centered in the page. So much room to the left as to the right. Uh, to indicate a problem with macros, let me just show you this. You might think, oh, that's the same. The first letter is being picked out. And then the rest is being left outside the line at the top of the page. And to fix that, we write message center line Jonathan. And now we get the same thing as before. So these are some fairly simple examples of what, what can be done with macros and also some of the difficulties that, that can arise with macros. Um, I think I'll stop at that point and I'll stop the share, we can resume it. And the issue really is when we start using macros, everything seems to be fine, or at least it seems to, seems to be not too difficult. And then we start investing effort into it. And somehow it's not providing what we need, but we've got this investment and we're locked into using macros. So certainly there's this tendency to macro packages to get larger and larger and more and more complicated. And Don Canoe's plain tech occupies, is one of the appendices in the tech book. And the plain tech, which is his basic control sequences, uh, adequate for quite a few documents, is together with this documentation, uh, about 20 pages in the, in the tech book, 20, 25 pages. So, so it's, sorry, did I say 20? 15, 15, 18 pages is, no, it's about 20 pages. Yeah, 20 pages in the tech book. It's, 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 it's not very big. Um, when I was preparing, I was thinking, well, how can I say that macros are difficult, aren't they? straightforward and a lot of the time that they are. But the best efforts of the later Camel team have an impressive success rate, given the difficulty of the subject, of converting LaTeX documents on the archive into HTML5 by reading the LaTeX documents. But a very significant uh, proportion of the documents, I think it's about 5% or perhaps more, even after much effort, simply fail to process, let alone give the right result. And that has to be down to macros. So, and they've put a lot of effort into this. And the other thing is that any transformation process that isn't reliable, and that probably means some number of nines, needs a certain amount of human intervention to 
to check things or at least authors correcting things or stuff like that. So I'm going to try and stop at this point and invite comments and we'll see what happens. Yeah, um, Jonathan demonstrated quite nicely simple macros with a single argument. Uh, but what you discover if you read the textbook is that it's possible to define macros that sprinkled among the arguments are punctuation or other chunks of text that sort of make up the pattern for how this macro is represented. Fortunately, that style is not widely used, but Don put it in and, and it, I'm pretty sure it's used in, in plain dot tech. Uh, but the uh, other issue is that if you look into the latex sources, you'll discover um, a command that has say five or six arguments, but, uh, and so you can invoke it that way with those six arguments. But internally what it does is it, it peels off the first two and hands them off to this macro, the next one into a second macro and the remaining two into a third macro. And this, uh, in my view, complicates understanding substantially, especially since comments tend to get stripped from text style file or latex style files. So uh, things can get hairy. And then the distinction between uh, a braced argument as Jonathan embraces versus the name, the string Jonathan, the macro sees that as a set of separate characters, each of which is potentially an argument. And those cause lots of trouble for beginning programmers and even users of macros. What's the reason to split it into groups of two? I, I think the issue was that they found when they implemented uh, a macro, something like contents line, which has a fair number of arguments for the table of contents, that it was convenient to, to break the work into separate functions that were invoked. But when you're trying to follow the logic, uh, say argument number five in this top level macro that you invoke ends up being argument number three in this low level macro that's somewhere else. And it makes it very hard to follow the expansion through. You can, mm -hmm. of course, there are lots of tracing flags you can turn on to see the expansions in great detail, but uh, often they lead to considerable complexity in trying to understand them and, and fix them. A, bi a big problem, I think, for people who write macros and also for the documentation of macros is that the parameters are numbered and they never have names. And the absence of named parameters anywhere is a big problem. The closest you can get is um, using key value arguments. So uh, I use Python because that's the language I know best as an example. There you can have positional arguments which are numbered but they have names. And then you can have key value arguments which essentially give you something like a dictionary. And the graphics package, graphic, the inclusion of graphics, for example, has a large number of arguments and uh, a key valve system is very, very important there because if you've got 10 arguments and you're using two of them, you're gonna say default, 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 default. This is the sixth argument, three inches. And that makes no sense to anybody. Um, yeah, and it's also noteworthy that the key value style was developed in the LaTeX project about 30 years after tech was introduced. So it was not easy to implement. And I think the authors deserve a great vote of thanks because they've made something that potentially is quite complex, have a relatively simple human interface, but it's a really challenging programming job in tech. Other so, languages so, make it, could make it much easier. Isn't, isn't the point that macros plus the other built-ins in the tech engine are said to be by the computer scientists Turing complete? Am I, am I correct in saying that? Which, yes. means you, which means you can compute just about anything provided you don't run out of memory using tech and tech macros. So that makes it extremely powerful, makes them extremely powerful, but not necessarily extremely easy to read and follow. 
Right. Uh, another issue for, for programming with macros is that often you want to deal with numbers and do computations on them. You want to take, say, 25% of the text width for one column of the table and 75% for another. If it's a simple scale factor, then with tech, you can say 0.75 backslash h size, and that is what you'd expect to get. But uh, if what you really wanted was that amount plus three points, it, it's a lot more awkward in tech. And the expression package that was also developed for LaTeX has made that much easier. Uh, but, and it's to me, I've always found it a strange limitation of the original design of tech was that there wasn't a proper expression grammar embedded in text macro processing. And that's, I think it has been rather unfortunate because it's made many things difficult that ought to have been easy. Now, now, now at this point, I'm going to take a different point of view from Nelson, which is that, um, well, I'll, I'll take an extreme example, which is that somebody has implemented a form of regular expressions using tech macros. And um, it's worthwhile understanding why somebody would want to do that, particularly as there are already so many different implementations of regular expressions. And this almost by its very nature has to be a, a different one with different capabilities. And my take on that, is that they're, comfort they're comfortable using tech macros and they are comfortable using regular expressions and they want regular expressions to be available. And so they implement regular expressions using tech macros. And this goes back to what Dwight says about it being Turing complete. So yes, you can do it, but if you want a general purpose language that has general expressions, then you wouldn't choose tech as that language. It's just that it's so to speak architectured such that to make regular expressions available to you, you have to implement them inside the tech framework. And similarly for doing calculations, so sine and cosine, which are perhaps esoteric mathematics, but they're quite important for the sizing when you rotate a figure. When you rotate a figure, you need sine and cosine to determine the size of the rectangular bounding box. Now you can compute them in tech and LaTeX, but you could also given suitable inter-process communication, shunt that computation over to somewhere else, or simply do that calculation prior to the typesetting process. So here's an example where tech macros were not used, which is Don Knuth's web system for literate programming, where he develops a custom parser for highly intricate structured text with a large amount of markup, a large amount of detail, a lot of which goes to getting the typography just right and for things like indexing. And the input document is processed in two different ways. One is for typesetting and the other is for compilation. And he did not write the typesetting routines to read the web source program directly. He said, we'll translate that using a program to create um, a tech document, which we will then typeset. And then that tech document becomes very much simpler. And the pro and the macros for that tech document are essentially those only requiring necessary for typesetting. And even the things like section numbering are not done by the tech macros. They're done as part of the conversion into the tech file. So the tech file uh, is about as simple as it can be and the macros in it are essentially for the point of view of concision and for um, independence of uh, control, uh, uh, dealing with one sort of problem here and one sort of problem there. So 
The question is to what size fonts you use. Well, that's a question for the macros. It doesn't affect the translation into the tech. Once you've got the tech file, you can then put in another file that decides the fonts and change the fonts if you want to. So for a long time, tech was outstanding as a program that produced reproducible results on all computers. And so that made it very attractive to use tech macros for everything because there wasn't another platform with that capability. But now it's all very different. And, uh, but we do have a large backlog of, of macros. So my, my point of view is let's have as few macros as possible and do as much as possible outside because when we're creating HTML, just as Don Knuth, when he creates compilable Pascal or C code and typeset documents, wants to be able to put comments into the C code that give the section numbers or the paragraph numbers or whatever, and put the same numbers into the typeset code. So when we calculate section numbers and equation numbers, we want to do that outside of tech and outside of HTML so that we have one process that does the um, that does those computations. So in a sense, it's a sort of cultural sort of thing. Uh, I mean, when I was a long time ago, when I was a boy, <laughs> um, uh, it was required to have either Greek or Latin in order to be admitted to Oxbridge, Oxford or Cambridge. And they then relaxed that and said, well, if you're studying science, you don't need those subjects. <laughs> Although perhaps if you're doing uh, biology, it might be helpful to have a bit of Latin. Um, so there is that sort of tradition and uh, we must always respect tradition, but we also have to be aware of the change circumstances. I've given a little speech here, I'll stop. Perhaps Nelson wants to come back. Yeah, I'll, I'll toss in some history here because there's, uh, those of you who are familiar with America know that there's large population bases on the East Coast and the West Coast, and then it's somewhat less in between. Uh, and in particular, the what many people consider the greatest uni universities in the country tend to be situated on either coast, uh, and less so internally, except possibly for Chicago. Uh, and uh, there's about 4,000 kilometers separating one coast from the other. So it was quite a big geographic distance. And the result of this was that there was an East Coast computer uh, architecture and computer science field that had one group of people that had companies like Prime and Digital Equipment and Data General and IBM and so on. And then there was a West Coast that had the Intel and Microsofts and Apples and so on. And uh, if you look at the history of compiling, Donald Knuth and Al Aho and Jeffrey Ullman, Al was at Bell Labs and Don at Stanford, these are really the fathers of modern compiling technology. And Al Aho was the one who, along with Ken Thompson, really pushed the notion of the value of regular expressions and weaved that into the production of, of compilers. But Don, who was on the other coast, uh, wasn't part of that culture and really didn't use regular expressions of most of what he, he dealt with. And so uh, there are programming idiosyncrasies that you can trace to this dichotomy between the two coasts of the United States and how what kind of tools people adopted. Also, the, the Alejo was working, of course, on Unix systems where Ken had introduced regular expressions fairly early on. And they were in many of the tools and the text editors and so on. And Don was working on mainframe operating systems at Stanford, which didn't have any of that. Uh, and so regular expressions really weren't part of our vocabulary until we moved into the Unix world. But they are extremely useful and languages that don't have them and, and are being used for text processing make your life extremely difficult. Um. Here's something related to regular expressions, which is that XML has something called XPath, which is approximately speaking, regular expressions for documents. 
rather than for text. So you can say, give me all the paragraphs that, give me all the chapters that have at least three figures and some other characteristics. Uh, so you can use that to subset text and you can use it to find text in interest. Give, pl please give me all the figure captions that mention Kansas. So those sorts of things are, if you like, regular expressions for structured documents. Now, there's something very interesting about tech, which is that the amount of memory it requires does not depend upon the size of the input document. It holds a page and a bit of the document in memory at any one time. Once it's got more than a page worth, it says to the output routine, get rid of this, ship it out. So it is very good if you've got a 10,000 page document, you don't need a big machine to process it. You just need a bit of patience. Now, Today, memory is much cheaper. Uh, I bought, it's, uh, it's about $100 for 32 gigabytes, something like that. Um, it doesn't mean it's free. Um, and it's customary to have the whole document in memory. Whereas tech simply does not work in that way. Um, and most of the XML tools do work in that way. And uh, they're considerably more powerful as a result. In certain circumstances, they don't have the same raw performance, but the time taken to program things is considerably less. So one of the biggest problems, I think, is that tech doesn't have a document object model, which means the whole thing organizes a tree where you can navigate it in the same way as you'd navigate a linked collection of web pages. And uh, the tech macro language just has no real conception of that. The only way it knows what the paragraph number is, what, sorry, what the chapter number is, is that every time it passes a chapter, it increases the counter by one. Um, so I'll stop at that point. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, it 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 um, it reminds me when I was when I was writing sort of he heavily in tech, I was always imagining wouldn't it be nice just as tech takes um, a whole paragraph into memory, and and works out the the shape of the paragraph. Uh, so, for example, a a, a long a, a long word on the penultimate line might change the uh, the spacing on the first line. I, I was always uh, sort of fantasizing, wouldn't it be nice if you took the whole chapter and did uh, optimization so that, for example, if you had a really bad float, some, somehow it, 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 would, it would optimize the whole chapter together. But as you say, it's, it's always taking one page and a, and a little bit at a time. That, by the way, is why LaTeX resorts to multi-pass right. processes to, to manage things and also to, to manage references and that sort of thing. If, if, you, um, if you have the whole document in memory, then you could fix up uh, numbering the equations and putting the equation numbers in in place of the labels it's essentially a text processing function. It's not a typesetting function. And if you had the whole document in memory, you could read the whole document in and fix it all in one go uh, and report all the errors in one go. And if you have a, a, something like uh, Microsoft Word or LibreOffice, uh, um, I expect that that's, that that's how they work when you sort of add links and remove links it just sort of keeps everything up to date. It just has one big tree. And it's sort of uh, the XML, SGML provide you, if you like, a text database. And instead of using SQL to do your queries, you use XPath or something similar. So I think that's one of the 
big, big problems with any conversion of LaTeX sources into either tagged PDF or into um, HTML5 is that there's no underlying document model. Now, if you have an XML document, you can read the document without processing it. You can form the tree without having any actions associated to any of the tags. Whereas, so if you like, the tags are simply tree construction devices. So an opening tag says, start a new element here and a closing tag says, close it now and go back to where you were. Whereas for tech, it's um, a chapter starts a chapter and it doesn't even start an element. It's just a new stream. It's just a, a, a marker in the stream of text. And then when you get to another chapter, it says, oh, well, that's the end of this chapter. So it must be this is the start of the next one. So we don't have any, any sort of tree. And that is an important part of the um, processing model of tech. I'm, when I posted this as a subject, I, I had in mind things that might be done to help the ordinary user. And Nelson has several times said, I believe, that um, Les Leslie Lamport's view is that you should always put curly braces around your subscripts and superscripts. And also that you shouldn't use a single dollar something single dollar to delimit your mathematics, you use backslash left parenth and backslash right parenth. And I have mixed views about that, which is it makes the tech source easier to use and more reliable to process, but it's a painter type. But what's, uh, I, under, I understand the first point, but um, uh, what about the two dollars compared to the other delimiters? Where's the actual difference there? I think two dollars is a disaster, frankly. That's, that's the display map where it starts a new line yeah. and centers yeah. a somewhat larger equation. Um, it, and Don put this in because he was used to writing mathematics. And of course, you need math in line and you need it in displays. But that's, for him, was about the only two kinds of math he needed to deal with. Yeah. So no, but I understand, you know, putting the superscripts in, 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 in braces, for example, it, you, you it retains the information. This is an argument. It's sort of a, a thing in itself. Whereas the other two are just different ways of indicating whether it's displayed or not. Yeah. So for, for me, I would always write X underscore N for X sub N. I wouldn't put the braces, but if I have more than one character, of course, then the braces are mandatory. It's just too much trouble to write three characters where one would do. Oh, sorry, what 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 was the reasoning, Leslie Lampo's reasoning for putting the curly braces? Just good. I, I think he probably uh, wanted to simplify it for users so that if he said, if you have a subscript, it always appears in braces. But as you say, it's, it's shorthand really that the rest of us know about that if it's one character, you don't need the braces. Uh, okay, here, here, here's something that came up in me when I was writing some mathematics earlier this year, which is backslash min produces a math operator like log and sine. Um, and I wanted to write L sub min. It fails uh, because it, min is in fact a math operator and you're not allowed to subscript with a math operator. I think that's a flaw in tech of some sorts, but it's the way it is. It, it, it could have been something else. And uh, by if we had put the thing in braces, that matter wouldn't have arisen. You see, what's happening is that the underscore will start a math element. The underscore will start a math element and it will end the math element as soon as it possibly can. And if it gets something given to it that can't be a math element, 
it complains. Now, what you can have as a math element is the first element of the math element could be the curly brace, and that sort of replaces the curly brace that LaTeX put there in to begin with, tech put in there to begin with. And so none of these problems arise. So um, if you have, for example, not equal, well, that's two horizontal lines with the, hor with the slanted bar, bar through it. And some, some of the not commands are built out of a not operate that puts the bar in, and some of them are separate glyphs. Now, if you have one of those things, so you have um, not tilde, for example, I don't think, okay? And you write, define a command called not tilde, which is awful because it's got two, two Ts in the middle, but there we go. Uh, um, then the result of underscoring it will depend on whether it's a single glyph or two glyphs, so to speak, put together. Um, and I think that's right. Uh, so if I did, uh, you saw what I did with um, uh, centerline Jonathan, centerline me. Well, what would happen would be if you did an underscore, if you did um, underscore me, you get underscore, you get subscript J followed by Onathan as ordinary text, as, 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 uh, as non-subscripted stuff. So the purpose of underscore brace, close, open brace, close brace, is that it removes the ambiguity and it's an ambiguity that can actually exist and vary depending on the implementation of the macro. So I think the logic is that it makes the language much more precisely defined because you don't have to know what the meaning of the command is in order to know that that whole command is typeset as a subscript. The upshot of this for a publisher is that it reduces scope for a whole number of glyphs of crazy glitches that occur because you make a change in macro definitions and, and um, for example you use a different font where you have to sort of fake up characters and uh, suddenly the stuff that was correct ceases to be correct so it increases the reliability uh, another disaster in tech well i use the word a bit Unwisely is an horizontal node. Dollar dollar doesn't mean begin display mathematics. It means an empty math formula. Now, to call that a disaster is unfair. Um, but to say that it's uh, not a quirk is also unfair. Sorry, can you repeat that? So you're saying if you're in horizontal mode and if you put dollar dollar that becomes an empty math formula. But if you're in horizontal mode and you put dollar dollar X, Y, Z dollar dollar, isn't then that- you a... don't get, Then the X, Y, Z are in Roman type, they're not attack mathematical. Try it. So hang on a minute. It's, it's... Oh, you have to, you mean you have to be in vertical mode before you put dollar dollar? No, no, no. When I, sorry, when I said horizontal mode, I mean restricted horizontal mode in an H box. If you're in an H box. Okay, got it, got it, got it. Okay. A, a dollar, dollar. Yeah. Uh, okay. Rest, uh, the, yeah, a uh, um, restricted horizontal mode. Yeah. Okay. You, you can sort of fix all these things by making dollar an active character and then giving it whatever meaning you want. And you can give the active character dollar the normal value and you hardly notice any difference but that sort of by and by. Um, oh, there's a couple of chat messages I've missed. Oh yes, Philip's mentioned uh, simplest Turing complete systems and uh, uh, an interesting book on computer culture called Accidental Empires. Alan Jeffrey wrote a article, uh, wrote an article and created a style file called lambda.sty. Uh, Tech has what's called uh, expansion and commands. And the expansion, which is done without executing any commands, 
is itself a Turing complete language. And Alan, uh, Alan Jeffrey wrote a little style file that's about 30 lines or something that provided an implementation of Church's lambda calculus, which is Turing complete, just using the expansion capabilities of tank macros, which means that it can, for example, compute prime numbers without even doing any assignments. Now, I, one of the problems with tech language, I think can perhaps be described by reference to uh, HTML templating languages, such as um, as used by, for example, Django and Jekyll, where you have two languages. You have a language for templates and a language for writing components that go into templates. So LaTeX provides a language for creating environments, and it also provides a language for, so to speak, using environments and putting environments together. So you can uh, use an environment inside another environment and so forth. And in Django and in Jekyll and all sorts of other places, uh, these two languages are completely different and have different capabilities. And that's because they're used by different people, often different people, or people with a different focus and for a different purpose. Um, so the templating language should be simple and straightforward and be focused on the generation of HTML. And it should not be capable of computing prime numbers. It should be capable of knowing even from odd because that's quite common to distinguish lines to allow you to sort of read lines in the table, not get lost so much. Um, and it requires a different set of skills. And it's really helpful to know when somebody writes their templates that they're not secretly doing mining for cryptocurrency. Uh, it prevents a large number of abuses of service, whereas uh, uh, arbitrary powerful Ruby or Python code, you have to, it exposes a whole bunch of dangers and capabilities. Now with LaTeX, you don't have that, it's the same language. And in particular, you don't have the sort of intermediate form that we've talked about before, or where you can say, oh, this is where the templating stops and this is where the programming begins. Um, so with, Don Knuth's web system for literate programming, you can say, this is where the um, weaving and tangling stops. It stops with a Pascal or C source file, and it stops with the tech source file. And then from there on, the C compiler does what it does, and the LaTeX and the tech document compiler does what it does. But the uh, the tech document doesn't have complicated macros because all that stuff has been done outside as part of, if you like, pre-processing. So that's, uh, what's the word? A different way of looking at templates. And the absence of this boundary between, on the one hand, you've got myself writing mathematics and it can almost seamlessly go into computing prime numbers. So somebody who wanted to could write a document, a math document. Inside the document itself, you could compute the prime numbers. And you might think, oh, this is wonderful, but, but it's not. And the wonderful way of doing that now is to use something like Jupyter Notebooks, where you have a document that has code fragments in it. And then those code fragments go to, a, a, I think they call it a kernel that actually does the calculations. So we're well out of sync regarding what other people are doing. I think we have my old friend Kave here. Uh, so speak up. Okay. We have my old friend Kava here with decades of experience in the publishing industry. And um, it's a sound is a little bit low. Oh, uh, I know you've worked with your company has worked with several different publishers, and I'd like to know what uh, your company's attitude and the publishers' attitudes are.
towards uh, user-defined macros. As an example, I write a lot about computers. And so I have a macro called backslash vendor, which takes an argument like IBM, Microsoft, Apple, and so on. And besides typesetting it possibly in a special font, uh, will also generate an index entry. Uh, those are relatively simple to deal with, but I wonder what do publishers have to say about that? Perhaps they don't care. Perhaps they say this is Kavit's problem. His company has to deal with it. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So, so th those are our problems or the, the, the vendor, the typesetters problems. Uh, you know, worst comes, worst case, you just hack it, rewrite it, whatever. Um, you, you, you with, uh, with, with all respect, you are the, the, the nightmare author, Nelson, because you're using really clever stuff, but it's only a very small minority of, of authors who do that, mostly use, you know, basic macros, but, you know, if, to, to undo that macro would be very difficult. Our job is we need to, in general, we need to create XML for all, all clients. So somehow we've got to go from what you have to XML. Um, we automate as much as we can, but you, you can imagine that might be, that, that would be difficult. So it would take longer probably to, to, to handle your file because we've got to go to XML, from XML then go to PDF, EPUB, et cetera or even back to another tech file, for example. So there's no general uh, um, solution to it, but because it's a tiny percentage, worst case, someone sits down and spends a few hours and, and, and just you know, rewrites it in normal LaTeX. That, that's the answer. For, for most of my markup macros, they're relatively simple. You backslash new yeah. command, macro name, one argument, and then it embeds that argument and say upright text or backslanted text or something yeah. like that. And those ought to be almost trivial to handle by a scanner uh, that converts to XML. Exactly. Uh, well, in that case, it's quite a complicated tech macro that now peels the arguments apart into tokens and does funny things and does regular expression matching. So, you suddenly become quiet. Yeah, yeah. The, sorry, maybe I spoke. The sound went. Yeah. Oh, yeah go ahead, Kyle. Yeah, no, um, normal macros, we, as we typeset, uh, so as we run the tech file, as long as your tech is, is running, uh, you know, it obviously it runs through tech, um, we, as it were, auto expand those. So automatically those are expanded. So we downstream, we get, we get what, is, what is output. Um, with using things like tech for HT, et cetera, and other things we've, we've done in house. So the chances are, so we run it first, and if it works, if the XML comes out, then, then that's fine. Otherwise, if, yeah, I can't give a general thing, but uh, the answer, but worst case, we would go in and, and do a, you know, manually change that into a form where it does, where it does produce the XML. Um, but, you know, there's no, uh, the, the sort of things we've been talking about today, tech is very complex. There's no general, you know, solution. And of course, people can do whatever they like. You know, you can have structured tech or unstructured tech. So we, we take what comes, comes, comes our way. But you're absolutely right. As far as the publisher is concerned, we have a contract with them. In the old days, they gave us paper. Now they give us the files. If the files work, it's fine. If not, somehow we've got to produce the, the deliverables that we give them in the prescribed time. And are, are the XML files the only product that you deliver to the publisher or do they also get the LaTeX sources? They normally do not get the LaTeX sources. We, we just produce XML, depends on the client, but normally XML and then PDF, um, HTML, normally they produce automatically from the XML. Sometimes we give EPUB, uh, and then there are other forms. They might want the references in, for example, in BibTeX format, etc. So, but but the interesting thing is most publishers do not actually publish the XML. So if you go to a publisher and say, if you subscribe or if it's open access, you can get the PDF, you can get the HTML, but the XML itself is normally you can't download that. 
Now, I'm trying to convince publishers that you really should do that. That is, that's the definitive content and not the HTML. Um, and allow people to take that and content mine it and, and produce, you know, different things from it, different, different outputs, a different PDF, for example. But, uh, but strangely, mostly they do not publish the XML. They keep it in-house. I'm going to suggest what might be an ideal solution, uh, which might also mean it's in, impractical in the real world, which is that the definitive version of the document has no macros in it. When I say no macros, I mean macros of the sort that Nelson is talking about, such as vendor. What it is, is XML semantically rich in a way that Carve would understand. However, there will be an automated process that would condense all this stuff that Nelson has defined macros for both. My understanding is that Nelson is defining macros so that his documents can be semantically rich and easy to type and flexible against changes. So one of the great things about BibTech is that you record the bibliographic information without regard to the bibliographic style. So the XML is in some sense definitive, but then when somebody wants to edit it, the, an editable view that can be created in which inverse macro transformations can be applied can we call them micros perhaps, where uh, all the IBMs and DEX and Dells and other vendor names in the XML gets translated back into XML macros so that somebody like Nelson can happily use the language he's used to writing. So you, now, I, I, no, go ahead. I'll, no, I'm, I'm, I'm putting for that as an I deal solution, which doesn't mean we'll wish and we'll get there, but it's sometimes helpful to, to know what, what is the, sometimes it's helpful to know the points of the compass, what the directions I'll, are. I'll give an example of, of information we're trying to, to retain. And this, I've been working with a colleague on collecting, uh, building up bibliographies of, of a number of journals in the field of biology. And uh, biology has a couple of things that are different about it in article titles that you don't see in the computer science logging uh, journal. One is that you have biological names like Drosophila and so on, uh, and you have geographical names that this was collected, uh, say, in Lake Superior or in the Amazon River. And the publishers, of course, don't have any markup for this. The only thing they might use is italics for the biological names, but the geographical names, uh, there's no markup at all. And so if you have a title that is the status of Lake Trout in Lake Michigan, you can't tell that Lake Michigan is a proper noun and Lake Trout is a common noun. Uh, and uh, this has meant a substantial amount of work that uh, where we put in the markup. So I write backslash bio name for the biological names and I'm considering backslash geo name for geographical names. I haven't done that yet, but I think it would be useful because so once you have that wrapper that says, this is a biological name, you can say, well, gee, what I would like to do is extract from this bibliography, all of the biological names, ignoring everything else. And I want to build up an index of the biological names. And I, I use this uh, macro wrapper as an example in our University of Utah thesis documentation to show that you can build up with proper markup in your tech file. You can mark things such that they're trivially recognized uh, and you can build up from a single set of indexes, uh, an index of biological names, an index of software packages, an index of geographical names and so on, which are really quite helpful to the reader. And, and of course, the goal of being an author is to, commute, to communicate information to 
hopefully a large number of readers and make their life as easy as possible. So that's why I would, I would not be happy if, if my bio name markers got translated back into italics in the XML because that critical information has been lost. Um, Nelson, you are, you, I'm 100% with you on that. Um, I, we, we would love to have the XML we would love to have semantic markup in the XML. That's what you want. But unfortunately, very, and we are sort of slowly moving towards that, but very few people are doing that. And if I may, um, uh, uh, I would like to lay the blame on Microsoft because Microsoft Word is what, to all intents and purposes, 100% of people on the planet use. And we've learned that the only way to distinguish things is by uh, um, font uh, 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 parameters. So italic, bold italic, italic, you've got four ways of doing that. Um, whereas what it would be ideal if really, if, if authors, scientists, as they write, they wouldn't say make something italic, but say it is a, a lake or it's a biological or it's a it, it's some some other describe it basically so you need to describe it first then in a pdf or html it might turn into italic but you could hover over it and it'll tell you what it is that is that, absolutely i'd love that however if you look at the xml uh the the standard xml for publishing is 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 jet journal article tag tagging system um I don't think it, people are, you know, thinking about. Uh, um, but put it this way: nobody's asking for semantics. Uh, but I would love to have that. Yes, sir, Jonathan. I believe that Kew Gardens are asking for semantics. Good for them. You know that we really ought to have semantics. Why? Why? If you think about it. Someone in economics, someone in biology, someone in mathematics, someone in biodiversity, they're all, they all have standard things or, or finance or legal. Italics means one thing, bold means something else. If you're a physicist, bold might mean the tensor or the vector. Um, and so the whole information in the world is being, if you like, uh, uh, the, the only semantics is bold or italic, which is, which is madness, really. And, and for a blind person, uh, the font change is utterly meaningless. And yet, if, if there were some XML markup that says, this is the start of a biological name, they could have a, a clue. It might be an audio clue where the, the, the voice changed in tone or, or accent. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Without having to be verbose and say, now comes a biological name, Escherichia coli, and biological name. Uh, fully, fully agree. Um, uh, um, so uh, at the moment, yeah, we, we are throwing all that information away and we are spending so much time actually doing that. The authors, the auth I feel the authors would love to do that. The authors know what they're doing. Let them write that information somehow. It doesn't take more time than, uh, you know, any other, uh, um, you know, font changes. But maybe as you write, you press a button and you get a pop up of the ontology in your particular area and you select this thing because because i'm in physics it doesn't tell me about lakes but it tells me about vector vector etc i know that's a vector you know I, I i've got into the habit of never using things like bold or things like that if i if i need to do something like that then i'll define a macro put it in my included macro file and then define it as bold or whatever and then for, for journals which use a different scheme, then I use a renew command to override it. And, but one reason that's not a general solution is that many journals who accept LaTeX say, we don't accept files if you use personal macros in them. And yeah. so then, they, then they say, well, you can use them, but then you can just do a global search and replace and convert it back, which sort of defeats the purpose. But that doesn't really work if you've got you know, macros with several arguments, some of which are optional and so on. Um, and it's not trivial, but as long as I can, you know, use my scheme and, and some, 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 some journal will publish it, I'll stick to it. <laughs> 
Life's too short to, to mess with stupid publishers. <laughs> it, it, it really is a yeah. It, it really is a be in the bonnet for me because it's 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 um uh what of course the pe people are coming out with AI artificial intelligence to then retrospectively guess what that might have been, but you know. <laughs> so what I think is we're throwing away real intelligence and bringing in artificial intelligence to guess what this what the author was saying. It's 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 not right. Kelly. Yeah, I have learned so much from everyone, and uh, the conversation today has been really interesting. And just from an outside perspective, Nelson, like I love how you follow all the rules and just the amount that you have taught me. But I think it's really funny that you think that putting in two additional keystrokes of the curly braces around a script is too much, but then you'll write the bio name stuff and all of these other things that you said <laughs> to make sure that all of the information gotcha. is there. <laughs> well, I, I can tell you that because I use Emacs, a very intelligent editor, and I have lots of function keys, long, uh, command strings like backslash bio name are on a key that's trivial for me to generate. But but the, the, the serious point, Kelly, it's a good point. However, uh, from Nelson's viewpoint, those curly brackets, uh, uh, curly bracket around an A or a one or a single letter is not adding any, any new information. It's keystrokes for nothing in a sense. Whereas- it's Information for me though, as a noob, like, for somebody that doesn't know exactly okay. what I'm doing, yes, the information means a lot to mean, me. Okay, means this is one unit. Um, yeah. Okay, whereas if you're a tech user. If you're a frozen. tech user like us, um, yeah, yeah, it's, and it's more, more readable with the curly braces, yeah, okay. So, somebody complained of the Perl language that it's a bit sort of incomprehensible gobbledygook and sometimes it looks just like line noise. That's when you sort of want a modem and there's an interruption on the line and you just get random characters. Mm -hmm. uh, so the redundancy is important. It's important in motorways to have a central reservation and also on the edge of the motorways a stopping zone where broken down vehicles can stop. Redundancy allows us to detect errors and avoid accidents. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, one of the advantages of this extra information. I would like to see a system whereby you could type X underscore two, and it will put the dollars in for you. Because it knows that the underscore requires dollars, and it reads back and says, oh, well, it must be on the X, and it reads forward and it says, well, that's the thing that's being superscripted. I'll put the dollars around there. And if he doesn't like it, he can complain. Oh, hang on. So you mean if you put a two and a space, it knows that that, oh, yeah, it, it knows that. Uh, well, that. Well, well, for example, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm just doing a simple example, which if you write space X carrot two, it will convert that into X squared. Just as when you're in Microsoft Word, when you type 30, 31 TH, it subscripts the TH to make it the 31st. Um, okay, so actually, that's a good point, because if you put a two, that means that means you didn't put a curly brace. So so that means the next character is going to be separate anyway. Yeah. So you could put okay. a curly brace as soon as you put the two, you don't have to wait for the space after. Yeah. But, but the, there's a sort of bit of a dis, dis, disjunct, if that's the word, between um, the way computer algebra does things and the way in which tech does things. So computer algebra has got no problem seeing three, 3007 as a, one thing, a number, whereas tech, you have to group it up to treat it as a number. And uh, one can argue about the reasons for it, and I'm sure the reasons that at the time were very good, because Tom Knuth wanted to write a typesetting system that he could use, and he didn't want to write something that was easy and comfortable for everybody, although he did his best. Mm. And he was writing on computers that would be left in the dust by a modern mobile phone of any quality. Mm. Well, I, I have to confess that for about 40 years... I we can't hear you. 
I, for about 40 years, I've been using Emacs for text entry. And the beauty of that editor is it's programmable. And so I have very sophisticated programming uh, for mm -hmm. LaTeX and tech entry. And an example I like to show students is if I type in the USA dot, that's what I've typed at the keyboard, that immediately gets expanded to in the USA backslash at sign dot. And why does that happen? It's because a dot is an overloaded character. It can mean end of sentence, end of abbreviation, or end of initial. And Don's uh, shorthand convention was that if a dot follows a lowercase letter, it ends a sentence. If it follows an uppercase letter, it follows an initial. And the difference between these two is the spacing that follows, an inter-sentence space or an inter-word space. So I, as a typist, don't have to remember the backslash at that says this dot actually ends this sentence because the mm. code looks at what is there and it says, well, if the previous character is uppercase and the one before is as well, then it's not an initial, it's an end of sentence. But if the previous character is uppercase and the one before that is not uppercase, then it's like an initial. And so then it just leaves it as the dot. And this makes life so much easier. If I type dot, dot, dot in the input stream, I get backslash L dots. I'd like to point out an optimization in what you just said that goes back a long time. When you use the words uppercase and lowercase, because in the old days, type came in cases and they're uppercase letters and lowercase case. Mm -hmm. That's right, they were, they, they, they were in different places. And you'd have to lift and stretch a little bit to pick up a letter uppercase A. And so that, that, that's an optimization to uh, when you're hand typesetting that the lowercase characters are immediately available and the uppercase require a bit of a stretch. And uh, I think for that sort of work, uh, all these small optimizations are very, very important. And the sort of all the niggles create distractions from the main thing. That's 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 the importance of a lot of these tools. It's like um, uh, when you're driving in a in a busy city, the last thing you want is a passenger and sitting next to you telling you about their holidays. You just want to concentrate on the driving if it's difficult driving. So the the way in which these things that reduce our ability to handle cognitive burden are really important. And that, that's why all this sort of automation, I think, is very important. So uh, the, the editor I use for Python does the indenting for me, which means that that's one less thing on my cognitive burden when I'm writing the code. We've gone past time. Anybody that wants to go can go. Uh, after I close the meeting, people can stay and we can discuss the Nobel Prize in physics. And uh, entanglement is one of the things I have a special interest in. So I can show my knowledge and ignorance for those who are interested. <laughs> Any closing remarks from other than me, please? Just a quick, quick, question, quick question for Nelson. Uh, soon after I started using LaTeX, I started using BibTeX as well. I'm still using it. And I've heard of something called BibLaTeX. Is it worth looking into? Um, there is a pretty thorough description in the upcoming edition of the LaTeX Companion, which is undergoing final proofreading stages at the publisher. So later this year or in the spring, you will have a lot of documentation about it. I have fairly mixed feelings about it. Um, my concern is that it must be possible to grammatically and rigorously verify that something is correct. Not the content of the strings, but the, the layout or the markup, the at The syntax of it, yeah. The syntax. And uh, when people push that into LaTeX, they've completely lost that. And that I find very, very troubling. That's a good answer. Yeah. You see, if from Canvas point of view, XML has the nice feature that the, the parsers are required to have a grammar file. And the grammar file will say that the chapter 
starts like this and it can contain things like a section and the section can contain a subsection, but it enforces that. You cannot start your document with a section followed by a chapter. You can in LaTeX because it's simply expanding it on the fly as you reach the backslash section of backslash chapter command. And that uh, leads to problems with people who don't understand logical markup and, and hierarchical structure. So XML is good from that point of view. However, it's incredibly verbose and it's, it's positively obscene when it comes to mathematics. Mm. You, you simply cannot write any mathematics by hand in XML. You need okay. some sort of a program that converts yeah. your input to that. Exactly. I'm gonna say 30 seconds on rigorous mathematics, which is the automated theorem, theorem provers and proof assistants will require rigorous machine readable mathematics. And um, that is, I think, a challenge, that will be a challenge for the tech community in 10 years time. Uh, Carve Kelly, options to closing words? No, it's been great. Thank you very much. Again, Jonathan, we have to thank you for this, uh, 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 these, uh, the, 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 the tech hour. I'm, I'm now all addicted. Provide, That's the problem. Mm. All I provided <laughs> is the table you sat around. Sorry? All I provided was the table you sat around. Well, it worked. It, uh, whatever you did worked. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Frank Zappa so. once said the most important part of a picture is the frame. I have a friend who made frames. All right, so goodbye, everybody. And for those that are staying behind, we'll have some hard quantum mechanics. Uh oh. <laughs>